everyone and welcome back to another game industry report. It's a big one. Sony's PS5 game showcase was last night and it was a fantastic showing. There were lots of video games and a price reveal. $500 for a PS5 and $400 if you are happy without a disc drive. But that somewhat is also the digital trap and that's something we're going to get into. However, there was a little bit of a problem because the event left out a lot of detail about launch. Now that did come out later as a part of a media wave, but it is rather telling that a lot of that detail would have been super important for potential buyers, like, say, the fact that some of the first PlayStation 5 exclusives are actually coming out on the PS4 as well. And also, the actual price that video games are going to be costing from Sony, at least from what we know so far. And that is the dramatic news of the evening, the fact that $70 is the base price, but just wait, because because some regions are going to feel that worse than others. So that means that today we've got a lot to cover and it's brought to you by our patrons who have recently helped us expand the size of our team. And if you want some cool physical loot from our game team in your post box, then hey, this month it's led by our warrior class pin. If you play a warrior and I don't know, D&D, whatever games you play, you're probably going to love that. And also a bunch of art and a sticker. So you get all of that and the support that's recently helped us expand our team, which will mean for you more content that is better. With that said, Thank you, patrons, and let's go. We should start with the event itself. It was no frills, just games, and that's how I like it. They opened up with Final Fantasy 16 as a console exclusive, and refreshingly, were upfront that the footage was actually recorded on a PC. They then, though, for 45 minutes, just blasted through game reveals and announcements, all explicitly captured on PS5 hardware. So, there was a solid gameplay showing for Spider-Man Miles Morales, which did look great, although a bit quick time event heavy. I will say. They also revealed a trailer for Hogwarts Legacy and then, of course, a very over-the-top set piece for Call of Duty Black Ops Cold War. And really, with that initial salvo, they pretty much hit, like, the core gaming audience. So that was pretty good. And even more good news is that they just continued to show games for the rest of the show. They rolled into a few minutes of just straight Demon Souls remaster, and uh, that was such a good move. And seriously, a Souls game has never looked that good before. It looks incredible. Then one of the bigger moves of the night actually was the PS Plus Collection, a selection of 18 of the best PS4 games available to download and play on PS5 at launch day and included in the price of PS Plus. Now that surely is no Game Pass, but it is Sony aiming for quality over quantity and certainly as a way to convert perhaps an Xbox or non-console gamer, the idea that you can get the big new console and then the greatest hits of the last however many years, I think that's going to be an attractive proposition. They then, of course, did have their and one more thing announcement at the end of the show, and that was the reveal of a new God of War game coming in 2021. Now, we all saw that coming, right? A new God of War. But I'll tell you what, 2021 is surprisingly soon, and I really think that's something that will be, like, foundationally important to the launch performance of these consoles. Seriously, I think that is going to secure a lot of pre-orders just alone as a piece of information. I mean, hey, you're getting Demon Souls remaster, you're getting Ratchet and Clank, and you know that God of War, one of the big premium exclusives, is just around the corner. That is going to be massive in the arithmetic that people are actually performing when it comes to this Christmas and when they're working out what their purchase is going to be. Overall, then, an excellent showing. It's bound to drive up excitement. It certainly did in the office, and it was a collection of great news. But part of that's because they conveniently left out a lot of things that people wouldn't really want to hear as much. So, remember when Sony said they believe in generational leaps? Well, apparently they do believe in them, but they haven't gone all in in that. Now, basically, in one of their statements following the event, Sony did announce to people that some of the PS5 exclusives will have... PS4 versions, which, I mean, hey, doesn't really make them PS5 exclusives, does it? And those games, actually, are Horizon Forbidden West, that surprised me, uh, Miles Morales, and Sackboy. Now, Demon's Souls is still PS5 exclusive at uh, launch, same goes for Ratchet when it appears later, as well as anything else. Now, what is interesting there with Demon's Souls specifically is there was a trailer up at one point that actually mentioned PC, and Sony have since said, no, that's not the case. Now, what's 
interesting there for me is that there was a similar debacle happened with Death Stranding, which of course ended up making it to PC. So I wouldn't be surprised if that, even though they're saying it's an exclusive now, if it just turned out to be a launch or like a timed exclusive. Now, overall though, this mixed idea when it comes to some of these PS5 exclusives also being in the PS4 does put a bit less stock in the idea that some of those games were built from the ground up for the PS5, unless it is the case that that was actually what happened, and then the games were backported to the PS4. If that's the case, I'd be surprised if they didn't suffer for it, especially on the base PS4 hardware. Now, those games do actually have a free upgrade plan available, though, and that is definitely a nice thing to hear. Overall, though, Jim Ryan, who's the, the head of that unit, he did say that uh, the PS4 community would continue to be important for the next three to four years, and that does make sense. Not everyone is going to move right away, and really, as long as some PS4 existing doesn't impact next gen negatively, then I think that's fine. I mean, remember, right, the PS2, that had sports games for years and years after. Same actually goes for the Wii, it had a bunch of games after its live too. And then even without new games like the live services and PS Plus games, that will keep the PS4 functional for quite some time. I mean, hey, people who just want to play GTA Online, they can do that. And then you've got to remember regions like Brazil, where tech is prohibitively expensive because of tax and imports. Like, the PS4 Pro costs the equivalent of $935 for Brazilians in 2018. And the PS4 was over $1,800 in 2013. That's insane. I feel bad for the Brazilians. Uh, staying a gen behind sometimes is the only way to actually have affordable console gaming for some of those markets. Now, despite this stuff all making decent sense, some people do feel a bit betrayed at the lack of a complete generational leap. And I think a lot of that is because Sony, you know, the, both these companies are trying to use their fanboys, right? Sony really tried to actually use the whole true generational leap as a pretty pointed response to rally their base against Microsoft's strategy, where, of course, Microsoft were far more upfront in just saying, eh, you can upgrade whenever you want over the next two or three years, whatever because that was just sort of Microsoft's way of doing things. Um, now, that, of course, did draw a little bit of iron criticism because a lot of people thought, well, does that mean that your games are going to have the restrictions of current-gen hardware? Because, yes, we'd all like to escape 2013 hardware, and certainly that is a debate that got filled right up full of ammo again when Halo Infinite, uh, well, looked decidedly current-gen. Overall, it kind of does ring a bit hollow from Sony now that they've confirmed that two of their biggest blockbusters are actually also PS4 games, but, hey... I think they'll still be fine, and it's not quite as bad as the Xbox situation. The PS5 is going to launch with true next-gen games like Demon's Souls Remaster and Godfall. Other first parties, then, like Ratchet and God of War, are likely to be the sort of big, true exclusives, and they will come long before Xbox's wave of next-gen games, and that's just going to be somewhere where Sony absolutely is going to win. So overall, yes, it seems not to be the point of policy, true next-gen, because of Horizon and Spider-Man Miles Morales, but it does really seem like Sony, for the most part, are doubling down on this true next-gen experience vibe, and the same goes for the hardware that they are offering. And what I mean here is that yesterday we talked about the Xbox Series S being a bit of a per man's shoes problem. Just Google that if you're not aware of what the per man's shoes uh, sort of problem or thought experiment is. Now, the Series S is not really next-gen. Like, it is architecturally, but it is still a low-power console, and it very much is a stopgap for people who can't afford a Series X. And the problem there is it's going to be obsolete faster. I mean, try using a base Expo now. It's not a good experience. Now, of course, there is one thing where the value of Game Pass, even on an Xbox Series S, is still going to be good, but still, it's going to struggle. Now, later, in interviews, Jim Ryan of Sony has explained that they want to give users certainty, and that's what Xbox aren't really doing. According to Jim, if you're buying a PS5, it is a PS5. Their goal was to ensure that players knew they would be purchasing a console that will be future-proofed. That, and also developers continue to tell them that they want to work without as many constraints. Now, the Series S, yes, it may have undercut Sony's offering in paper, and it might be a good move to capture the user base with less disposable income, but it is going to be a console of short-term value and a bit of a price trap. The digital PS5 is close enough to it in price that I think the Series S just is not as compelling of an option if you can make the extra hundred dollar stretch because if you could you really would be getting more true next gen instead of being stuck with the series s which is 
a significantly less powerful console than either the Series X or the PS5. Now, with Xbox coming in, right, with, uh, you know, sort of a big low point in when the Series S and a high point in the Series X, it seems that Sony may be trying to capture a bit of a Goldilocks sweet point in the middle, where it very much is the cheapest true next-gen experience you can get will be the disk driveless PS5. Now, of course, in a way, it is a bit of another trap. So, let's talk about the digital trap. Yes, the console is $100 cheaper for digital, and of course we all do know that a disk drive very much does not cost $100 in manufacturing costs to add. And that means that it's obvious, right? This is a play to get people into the digital-only ecosystem. Now, the Series S largely does do the same thing. It's something both companies do want to do. Basically, right? You know, the platforms, like, get a much larger cut on digital games because there's no retailer cut, there's no manufacturing, there's no distribution or anything like that. It's just more efficient for them. They also get to control the price point forever. You know, retailers, they can cut physical costs whenever they want, they can do pre-owned things like that. But digital, well, there's rarely sales, and where there are sales, they are high margin and they are more controlled. It's also a marketplace that only shows you their games. Amazon might show you an Xbox exclusive when you are looking for video games, but if you're on the PlayStation Store, you're not going to be led astray, right? That's not going to happen. Also, the games that are the most, uh, you know, sort of best, right, for the likes of those two big companies is their own first-party games. And that does mean when a God of War game comes out, Sony can make the entire PlayStation Store be totally focused on that and drive customers where they actually want them. Now, this is kind of where we get to the real, real juicy bit, and that is price, and that is the fact that PS5 first-party games are $70. Non-negotiable, that's what it is, and quadruply so if you are on a digital-only console. No pre-owned, no retailer sales, you are just stuck giving Sony whatever they're asking for. And that does mean that, yes, they've sold you that console for $100 less, but in you having to purchase more expensive games over time, you're probably going to have a higher lifetime cost of ownership, especially if you decide to expand your onboard storage. So if they can convince us that the games, you know, are now worth $70, then hey, that's fine. But for many people, $70 will be a bitter pill to swallow. And guess what? You'll be swallowing more if you're outside of the United States of America. The Europeans are being charged 80 euros. The Australians are being charged 125 Aussie dollars, and the Canadians will be paying just over 100 Canadian dollars. Now, for some of those regions, that will end up being, once you actually crunch all the numbers, relatively a bit more expensive than it would be in the USA. And that, of course, will feel a lot worse if you're then stuck in a digital ecosystem where you are far more tied to the, like, the recommended retail price set by the publishers. Now, Sony, I think, can get away with their microtransaction list blockbusters costing $70. I think most of us would be happy to pay a pretty high cost of entry for that high caliber of game, at least for the longer games. Maybe not for some of their shorter ones, like the shorter Uncharted's. But still, games like Witcher 3, Red Dead Redemption, yes. $70, they're totally worth that because there's so much content. And you know what? I, in principle, I am pro having flexible value-based pricing for AAAs. I think you've got games like Star Wars Squadrons, which maybe shouldn't be $60. Then you've got games like Red Dead Redemption 2 that are big enough to warrant $80. You know, it's what we do in the indie space. And that's all fine for me to say. But here's the thing. In the indie space, do you see them gouge price and then stuff it full of microtransactions? Normally, no. So even if we can have a principle-based discussion about how, yes, a video game that offers a incredible experience for many hours is probably worth 70 or $80, we can have that in principle. But we also know that some third-party publisher is just going to use that as a justification for, you know, a $70 microtransaction-laden nightmare. And I'm pretty sure 2K games are going to run into the breach there. They already, of course, have had their entire debacle over that, and it was with a sports game, which, of course, will be microtransaction-laden. So, yes, that's uh, a little bit iffy. I'm pretty sure our cost of games is going to go up. 
And next, to round things off, we've got pre-order shenanigans. Where, yeah, they've gone a little bit wild. So, where Xbox set a date well in advance, which was really quite nice of them, because it means we can all prepare, Sony, uh, they just kind of said nothing. I mean, they had that thing where you could sign up for an early pre-order, and I guess what? They just totally forgot that? Because, officially, while pre-orders began today, well, Matt and our team, uh, well, he nabbed one from Game in the UK when they opened the pre-orders just after midnight. So that was a bit weird. Now, stocks also seem extremely low in places and demand seems super high. GameStop site actually crashed and Amazon ran out of units within 20 minutes. So it really does look like you're mostly out of luck if you didn't have one or you know, get your pre-order in. Now, for physical pre-orders, they also seem to be a poor move. The gaming news Twitter is on fire with stories of GameStop stores receiving less than 20 full price units and single digit numbers of digital only units and also some GameStop store managers just not really being kept in the loop as to what was even going on. Now, despite Sony saying they would have more PS5s than they had PS4s at launch, well, those rumors, uh, there was the one from Daniel Ahmad of, uh, you know, the supply restrictions being so bad that both parties were using really expensive air shipments to get stuff there faster. Uh, it does seem like, though, those rumors that, you know, it was initially, what, 15, 16 million units planned that's now down to 11 because of supply constraints. It seems like those actually might be true and that we may indeed have a pretty darn rough launch. So overall, to close this video, the showing from Sony was excellent. We cannot deny that if you're into video games, they just gave you a lot of games and they pretty much all looked great. But there are just some tricky little bits here and there that are a little bit grim to some of the core gaming market. Then there's also, of course, the digital trap that many are going to find themselves in and, uh, you know, in all honesty, it's it's just an interesting situation. You know, if you make great products and you run a stellar platform, sure, try to get as much revenue as you can. But I guess it's just that thing where we can't really trust it not to go wrong somewhere. Are Sony going to start gouging people with expensive, like super expensive microtransaction laden games that are nickel and diming people? No, I don't think Sony will do that. But will other people in the industry do that? I mean, if they can get away with it, of course they're going to do it. So that's kind of what's up there and is a little bit, a little bit iffy. But as far as console war goes, you know what? It's an incredible night for Sony is what I'm going to say. But will that matter to Microsoft? Because their plan is to just offer a whole bunch of value and to get people to get Game Pass. And ultimately, I am probably going to get a PS5. I'm going to get both for work, obviously, but I would get a PS5 if I only had to pick one, and that's partially because I'm a PC gamer. And guess what? As a PC gamer, I'm going to play Halo anyway, and I'm going to have Game Pass anyway, in all likelihood. So in a way, Microsoft have set things up so that they can actually lose the initial thrust of this console generation but still win because they have really tried to double down on recurring revenue bundles and just having an entry in the market absolutely everywhere. You've got to remember, these consoles are almost certainly being sold at a loss, right? They're not making money when they sell you a console. They make you money by getting you on their platform and selling you games on their platform. That's somewhere where Sony is going to do better on the hardware side, but Microsoft is more aggressively expanding their platform by offering it in more places. So it's definitely going to be an interesting one, and I wish we would get detailed financial statements of what all this is like, but somehow I imagine both companies will only show the numbers that are, you know, looking good for them. So we probably won't really know that much, or at least we'll have to read in between the lines. Anyway, that's it for me. That's the analysis of this situation. Of course, if you want to support us a bit more and also get some cool physical loot, you can check out the Patreon. A big thanks to the patrons. We've recently increased the team size. We now have uh, someone on who is leading the titles and the thumbnails and another editor as well. And what this has basically just meant is uh, between both of our channels, we're able to just get a whole bunch more done, which, uh, and also just do things right instead of doing them chaotically, which we sometimes do. So that's all stuff I'm excited for. And a lot of your support is what has actually allowed that to happen. So thank you. That's it for me. And I'll see you next time.